she thought I was brilliant. And uh, Pamela, if you're listening, two things. One, sorry for the deception. And two, if you're ever in Nashville, I'd love to take you out to dinner and drinks. Hello, welcome to episode 27 of The Bitcoin Game. I'm Rob Mitchell. So now I present for you the Bitcoin Blues. Bitcoins and Gravy has always been a hugely influential show for me. In a sea of podcasts with barely existent production values, here was a Bitcoin podcast that sounded as good as any podcast I'd ever heard. Everything from the audio to the short musical pieces between segments was done to perfection. I got the low down Bitcoin blues. I'm crying here the low. When I realized John missed releasing an August episode of Bitcoins and Gravy, I checked in with him, wanting to make sure he was okay. He said he was, but that he was moving to every other week. But then a couple more weeks went by, and still no Bitcoins and Gravy. It was clear something was up, so I asked him if he might want to come on my podcast and let us all know how he's doing. He agreed, and we spoke for almost two and a half hours. You're about to hear our edited conversation. Enjoy. My only Bitcoin just to buy a two-day pass. I got the low down Bitcoin blues. I'm crying. Can you hear me now? Yes. You can? Perfectly. Oh, nice. <laughs> How you doing? Oh, I'm okay, Rob. How are you? Oh, no. How should I take that tone of voice? Uh, just, I don't know, Rob. I'm just, uh, I guess I'm just old and tired. I'm sorry to hear you're feeling that way, John. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just worn out with life and just worried and worn out. I'm small and I'm white and I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait a minute. Hang on. <laughs> Rob, it's true. It's true. I'm small and I'm white, but I'm not scared. I'm full of life, my friend. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> Did I scare you? You're just tripping me out. <laughs> you didn't do any LSD or mushrooms before this interview, did you, man? <laughs> no, we can check both of those off. <laughs> okay, n none of those? <laughs> Neither of those. Definitely not. Man, it's great to hear your voice. How have you been? It's so weird. I can't decide if I'm talking to you or talking to you for the <laughs> for my podcast. It's very strange. I'll let you lead. You can, you know, introduce me or, you know, introduce it like you would a normal guest or whatever. Just, you know. I, I almost feel like starting with you talking right there. Like that's the beginning of our interview. Yeah, man. You can start wherever you want to. John Barrett. I think I first heard your voice when... Did you enter a contest to be a podcast uh, when Let's Talk Bitcoin was just starting the network? Yeah, man. It was uh, when he put out the call for, um, you know, new shows and the contest. And Lidge and I heard about it. I had just gotten Lidge into Bitcoin. And he said, why don't we start a podcast with you, John, as the host? And I said, well, hey, that's a great idea. Let's do it, man. Well, it ended up being, you know, dual host, Lidge and I, which was great, you know, for a while. And, you know, we submitted that to Adam and we won Editor's Choice and started doing the podcast. And uh, I think we did 30 episodes and then Lidge went on to do his own podcasting. And his own back to his business, you know, he owns a studio here in town. And then I took off from there just on my own, just solo and did uh, up to, I think, 73 episodes total. So I think I did 43 episodes on my own. And then uh, needless to say, uh, I got burnt out. Wow. I, I want to really travel the road before we get to that statement. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm just going to walk you through my knowing of you. I'm remembering because I was doing a little bit of whatever graphics work for Adam. And I remember talking about the contest and he did seem most excited about you. I think was Mad Money Machine. Was that also introduced at that time? Oh uh, yeah, it was. Yep. All right. So that's someone else who's no longer. <laughs> uh, then there was also Ed and Ethan, the Canadian guys. Yeah. And they seemed like they had such a big thing already going, but I don't even know. Did they just withdraw from LTB or did they just disappear? I don't know. I don't know, man. 
the Canadian Mounties might have come and collected them and taken them off to the, whatever the Canadian equivalent of FEMA camps are. <laughs> I love those guys. You and Lidge, had you, what was the closest thing to this podcast that either of you guys had done before this? Well, Lidge had been looking into podcasting and he'd talked to a friend of his on the East Coast who said, hey, you know, here's what here's what podcasting is all about. You should do a podcast for your recording studio. And Lidge and I were just doing some work in the studio. I was doing voiceover work here in Nashville, specifically for the Goodwill Industries of Middle Tennessee, doing in-store spots for them. And I still do those. So I was recording some of those there at uh, the Toy Box studio, Lidge's studio. Lidge and I met by way of Craigslist, where I had this old German pump organ from the 18, late 1800s. So I put it on there for sale. I think I said $250 or trade for silver. And <laughs> he contacted me and then a few days later came over to my house with a big old leather suitcase just packed full of his family silver. And, you know, I was salivating because I was a silver bug at the time. And I'm thinking, man, does this guy have any idea what this silver's worth? Maybe he's going to say, look, I'll give you the entire suitcase full of silver in exchange for this pump organ. It didn't work out that way. He had been briefed by a friend of his, so we ended up weighing out basically $250 worth of silver, and uh, we did the exchange, and I still have that silver that was his family silver that he has no interest in, really. But that was the beginning of me meeting Lidge, and then, you know, knew he had a studio, did some voiceover work there in the studio, and uh, became friends with him, and then, you know, the podcast after that. I had uh, been into Bitcoin for some time, and, you know, every time I'd get back in the studio with him, I'd say, man, you've got to check out this Bitcoin thing. You've got to check it out. And I finally got through to him. And that was right around the time here in Nashville, we had our very first Bitcoin meetup. Uh, John Meese and another another guy named John put this thing together and had the very first Nashville Bitcoin meetup. And Lidge and I went to that and he got all excited and, you know, he got the bug, he got the Bitcoin bug and, and we were off to the races there. And like I said, submitted that entry to Adam and one editor's choice. And all of a sudden we were on the Let's Talk Bitcoin network and also on KCAA uh, AM radio out of Loma Linda, California. So we could brag to people, you know, we're on KCAA Loma Linda, <laughs> which was exciting. And I'm not sure exactly how that whole thing you know, went away and dissipated. After we won Editor's Choice there on Let's Talk Bitcoin, that began our career of podcasting and, and meeting all of the great people and setting up interviews. And, you know, we would go into the Toy Box studio and we'd write out some script and some questions and we'd interview these people that were, all, you know, on the other side of the world, whether they were in Russia somewhere or whether they were in Great Britain or Australia or local people we'd bring in. Great stuff, man. That very first one was actually a guy that we just grabbed that we had met at the first Bitcoin meetup and said, hey, man, you want to be interviewed for the show? And we had no idea what we were doing, of course. And, uh, you know, we grabbed him and, and interviewed him, and it was somewhat interesting. I was new to it. Lidge was new to it. I did most of the talking, and Lidge did all of the editing and everything for the show because I, at that time, had no real Pro Tools experience putting together a show, although I do have a background in, in audio tech. The interview that sticks out to me the most is probably like a really good get. And, and I may have missed some was uh, Patrick Byrne. That's right. Yeah. What would you feel was one of your best gets? Certainly, I was most excited to interview you, Andreas Antonopoulos. Sadly, I didn't really accomplish what I wanted to accomplish with that interview because I really wanted to ask him details about his upbringing, his childhood, you know, how he got into computers and all of that. And I didn't really go there. But, you know, it's it's difficult with Andreas because he really has so many important things that he wants to talk about that when he's speaking, I find it very difficult to interrupt him because the content, everything he's saying is so rich and so true and so good. Uh, I feel humbled. I don't feel like I can say, hang on, let me, let me direct the course of this conversation because you know the content he's putting out is... Uh, uh, just so timely and so relevant. And, and so I, I really enjoyed that interview. But yeah, I think probably the interview with Patrick Byrne was maybe a highlight of the show. But man, there were so many great interviews, so many interesting people that Lidge and I talked to and then I talked to on my own over the you know year and a half, you know, including Paul Vigna from the Wall Street Journal. I love the guy that's there in Thailand who's living there. The trader? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's so funny. See, I listen. Yeah, oh, yeah you, do, you do listen. Thanks, man. Yeah. And I love Nick Pudar is great. And Nick Gogarty with uh, Solar Coin was a great interview. Uh, Max Hernandez. I love that interview. He's the guy that wrote Thieves Emporium. 
he's the author. Just so many, man. It's just, I can't even believe how many unbelievably cool people. You had a really well-produced, fun podcast that I thought couldn't really tell exactly your levels, but it seemed like you were really definitely learning. And Yeah. But somehow, as, as the show went on, you, to me at least, started to become more this wise sage. You maybe were saying some more of your own views a little more and more as the show went on. I mean, does that ring true to you? Yeah, I think so, man. I mean, you know, I have been into Bitcoin since 2011, so I've been learning along with everybody else, right? And, you know, the more I read and listen to those people who are the gurus, the more I learn, right? So I'm really just repeating what they're saying. I'm really just parroting them, and I'm really just standing on the shoulder of these giants. When you listen to someone like Andreas talk, he says, you know, when he first read the white paper, he fell into it. He didn't eat for months and he was just, you know, it was, it was all consuming for him. Well, that same thing is true for me, except on a non-technical level. You know, I fell in love with Bitcoin as a foolish young man falls in love with a woman because she's beautiful. You know, there's so much appeal to Bitcoin on so many different levels, the financial level, you know, the change the world level, uh, the crypto anarchy level. And I've never really been very political in my life. I have strong opinions, but I don't consider myself a liberal or a crypto anarchist or an anarchist or a conservative or a progressive. I just don't have a label that I put on myself. You know, if anything, I just tell people that I like to speak about what I believe is true. There's just something about your delivery. You have a gift or something. You know, you come off very large in life. And I met you in real life. And I still, when I get back and listen to your podcast, I forget about the real person I met and hear, you know, John <laughs> Barrett, the, the cowboy Bitcoiner with the official Bitcoin song. <laughs> so that's a whole other thing. You came out with this just really beloved song. I mean, maybe it's just the circles I'm in, but I certainly haven't seen Bitcoiners follow a song like your song and, and love it as much. So you have all these different bases covered as far as I think earning people's, you know, love and respect as a content creator, as a, you know, podcaster, as a musician. I don't know if you can see it, but I think you're probably highly esteemed in the Bitcoin community. You know what I'm saying? It's hard to say, man. It's, I mean, it's a matter of perspective. I mean, I, you know, I'm surprised through all the time that I did the show that there was never, you know, a Bitcoin babe that fell in love with me, right? That's what I was hoping, really. I mean, that's basically why, why I've been doing the whole thing is just trying to attract a Bitcoin babe, but it didn't work. I saw in, in a large sense, I feel like I've failed. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking about the Bitcoin babe, although it would be nice, right? Come on, Bitcoin babes. Yeah, Bitcoin babes. Where are you? Come on, come out of the woodwork. Hello. You came up with a second song, um, I think the second one was um, Bit the Bitcoin Blues, the low down Bitcoin Blues. I think wasn't it? Wow, I'd forgotten about that. I meant the more recent one, but but I do remember that. How you don't mix that in your shows much? Yeah, man, I should have put the uh, low down Bitcoin Blues in there more often. So yeah, there's the low down Bitcoin Blues, and then there is the Bitcoin Trader, which I think is the most recent one that came out. And then I think in between there, there was the um, Crypto, the official cryptocurrency song. The reggae song. I and I, it's so crypto, man. The official cryptocurrency song. I hope all my brothers and sisters around the world will sing along. Look at the cryptocurrency, man. It's such a blurrency. A new one every day. They got the pump and dump, they try to make you a jump. You better watch your you're a back, I say. I hear the troll box singing till my ears are ringing. I'm afraid just to go to bed, and I'm not feeling so well. Tell me, should I buy or sell? When it comes to the name of the show, he and I came up with that tongue in cheek. It has not been the best name for a show because when you're trying to get sponsors, you know, and you're trying to be taken seriously by people in financial tech or whatever, and you say, you know, the name of our show is Epicenter Bitcoin. Let's talk Bitcoin. You know, those sound serious, right? Yours even sounds serious. The Bitcoin game. It's like, what's is that what it's called? That is what it's called. Yeah, the Bitcoin game. You know, that sounds like it could be something that's like, let's play, let's do this thing. But Bitcoins and gravy, like, what the hell is that? Well, I never would have thought about that. But 
I guess I could see, yeah, if someone's not familiar with the podcast and they hear the name. <laughs> it's, it's whacked. I don't know if I ever told you this or not. The first time I interacted with you was when you and Mad Money Machine were new shows and Adam actually hired me to make graphics for all the new shows. So I actually took Bitcoin keychains and put them in this uh, <laughs> gravy that I bought that was like for biscuits because I didn't really know anything. I was just being literal. And I took a bunch of pictures and made like a picnic table, kind of red, white checkerboard. And I guess he submitted it to you guys and was like, uh, no, <laughs> no, we got this. And then you guys came out with your really nice art. Dude, that's hilarious because I never knew who that person was. I never knew that was you until this moment. Lidge and I just laughed our asses off. We're like, somebody put Bitcoins. I mean, we know they, <laughs> we know they weren't real Bitcoins, right? Like, cassatious Bitcoins. Someone put these things in gravy and actually took a picture. Like, did they just make some gravy? Did they go to, like, you know... Bob Evans or whatever the Cracker Barrel and get get an order of gravy or how did they do this? We thought it was hilarious, but then yeah, uh, Jamie Anderson, who's a local graphic artist, she came up with this bitcoins and gravy thing for us. But that's so funny to learn that that was you that did that. I never knew that, man. That's so funny. Today's magic word is Barrett. B A R R E T T. Use the magic word to claim your share of this week's LTB Coin listener reward on letstalkbitcoin.com. I was invited by Anthony DiOrio to come up and play the Ode to Satoshi, the official Bitcoin song up in Canada, and I couldn't make it. Then I was invited into the island, some island where they had this private getaway, the Satoshi Round Table or something. I don't know. It looked like the Knights of the Round Table and everything. It was a private thing by invitation only, right? You had told me Bruce Fenton had invited you to that, and I thought that was really impressive that someone was willing to fly you in and everything. So how come you couldn't make this one? I could lie. You know, and uh, I did. I did actually when I saw uh, when I saw Bruce at the at the Bitcoin conference in Austin. I actually, you know, had lied to him, so I had to, you know, I had to support that lie. And you can you can play this on the show. I'm I'm fine with it. Uh, I told him that I had had a you know previous engagement or something come up where I had to travel to California. Uh, I did end up traveling to California, but the truth is that I kind of got paranoid. I kind of thought. This guy is trying to get because I looked into a little bit into his background and there was something that he had some some tie he had to something in Saudi Arabia. I'm like, man, this is weird stuff. And so I thought, you know, I'm afraid to go there. Why would why would someone in this in the Bitcoin world with all of these important Bitcoin people coming to this island? Why would they want me uh -huh. to, to show up there? And why would he be, you know, offering to pay for my flight and my room and board while I'm there just to come play Ode to Satoshi? It didn't make any sense to me, you know. So my the theory I came up with was that someone wanted me there so they could kill me. <laughs> so, Wait, John. Yeah, you, no, I'm serious. I'm serious. So I so I decided I'm not going to go because I don't want to die. How sure were you someone wanted to kill you? This was an elaborate scheme. I really was not con completely convinced. So, there, you know, there were a couple of things. I've got a back issue. I've got bone spurs in my neck. So I was thinking, okay, I mean, and, and this was going to be a fast thing. I was going to fly in on, let's just say it was a Thursday, right? And then be flying back on like a Sunday. Like I'm flying all the way to some foreign country to an island to play Ode to Satoshi. On, I mean, it'd be 12 hours on an airplane. That far, huh? It was going to be like two different flights. It was going to be a long travel day. And then I'm there with just me and my guitar playing Ode to Satoshi. And, you know, where am I going to be staying? Do I know any of these people? Um, you know, I, I know some of the people, you know, from their notoriety, but do I know them personally? Am I going to have a good time there? Is it going to be a relaxing, fun time? Uh, and, you know, I've got a little bit of a belly. I'm like, I'm white because it's, you know, I haven't gotten out of the house often enough. Like, man, I don't, you know, I don't really feel comfortable on the beach. I'm not sure if I really want to play the song just there with my guitar and feel like a jackass. I've got a long flight, two different flights. Um, plus, you know, they might try to kill me. Somewhere. <laughs> Someone might try to drown me in the in the Mediterranean or the or whatever ocean that is out there. And I thought, yeah, I'm just I'm just not going to do it, man. So I did I didn't go about out, but uh, I do regret that. On the other hand, um, I still think it is possible that someone was going to try to kill me. 
Can I put a laughter track there? Do you- <laughs> well, I, I'm, la- I'm laughing, but, you know, I, I mean... What motives would someone have to kill you? To silence me, man. I don't know if you remember how Mad Money Machine went out, but uh, it was very religious. Man, when I heard that, it kind of threw me for a loop, to be honest with you. I remember... Um, Paul, Paul, Paul... Moyer. Uh, Boyer, Boyer with a B like boy. I actually advertised on a couple episodes of his show because I could get the sense that you could just hear it, you know? Yeah. People, people will start telling you, you know, hey, we could, I could use some tips around here. You know, this is a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I advertised a couple of times trying to help support the show, and it seemed like a good deal to me too. Yeah. And um, soon after that, though, I guess his last show came, and yeah. I just realized I was feeling that way with you. <laughs> I think you, you didn't have to listen very carefully to, to hear you basically saying, you know, this was a lot of work. Could use a few tips here, guys. <laughs> Come on, you cheap bastards. Um, Cough up 50 cents an episode. I heard that, so I was like, oh, you know, I, it took forever, but finally I got an ad on your show, and you actually aired a, a second one on your last show. Um, and then you were gone. It's starting to look like you're to blame. <laughs> <laughs> you're cursing. You're, you've cursed these shows. No, oh, I'm just man, kidding. my intentions are so good, too. I know your intentions are great. I think I'm a symptom. A symptom, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm the symptom, but not the cause. Um, well, no, I mean, you're, you know, the reality of the situation is that you're one of the people out there who is listening closely and who understands these guys are working really hard. Now that you're doing your own podcast, you're realizing, wow, this is a lot of work. You know, And it's funny to me because just human nature, the way things are, the way, th- the way people are so passive these days or the way people are also so selfish. It's so funny. I mean, I have, since I've been in the Bitcoin, world. I have tipped so many people. I mean, it could be thousands of times. I don't even know. 10 cents, 50 cents, $2, $4. I mean, I just tipped Adam B. Levine $4.90 for something that I read or one of his shows I listened to recently. I don't remember what it was. I think it was something he had written. But, you know, I've been very generous because I really enjoy that content and I really want to tip and I really believe that's the way we should do it. So, you know, at one point I had a show that where there were 10,000 listeners in one week and then I think it got up to like 14,000 listeners in a week. I thought, well, this is amazing. I can monetize this show at some point. And I tried and I tried and I tried and I kept failing. Almost had someone that wanted to advertise with me, then they'd back out. Almost had someone else, then they'd back out for whatever reason. I don't know. But, you know, I always thought, okay, you know, as the numbers declined, as Bitcoin price went down, the numbers declined on Let's Talk Bitcoin. I had steady 3,500 listeners a week. And you think, gosh, darn it. If each one of these listeners would just tip me 25 cents, I can continue to do this show and be proud that I'm actually putting in 10 hours a week to create a show that's actually going to pay some bills as opposed to just continuing on not making any money at all, you know, five bucks a week, whatever, and then getting paid in LTB coins, which is totally cool. That's a great thing that Adam set up. But, you know, with the price of LTB coins, you know, nobody's getting rich here, right? I think it's human nature, man. People, they want their content and then they're usually just going to read what they want or listen to what they want. And then they're just going to go on to the next thing. And, uh, you know, maybe a lot of people that listen to the podcast or that read the content on Let's Talk Bitcoin and elsewhere on the Internet, maybe they don't even have Bitcoin wallets. Maybe they don't even have an easy way to tip. Maybe they don't know how to tip. Maybe they're just listening and learning. And I don't I don't really know. But uh, I think the Bitcoin world is certainly a reflection of the real world that we're all used to that you know we all know that that not everybody in the real world is naturally a humanitarian naturally a philanthropist so the bitcoin world of course like any world is a reflection of the real world that we all know and love and hate Sadly, it's not utopia, is it? (laughs) No, it's not the utopia that I thought it was going to be. (laughs) You know, there have been a few things in the Bitcoin world that have broken my heart, if that's fair to say. 
Um, you know, I've had my heart broken so many times by life. I think, you know, if you're a sensitive person and you're in tune with what's going on in the world and you're not missing out uh, on the signs and also uh, the history and knowing your facts and knowing what's ha happened before and what's happening now, it, it's a heartbreaking world in many ways. It's a joyful world and a wonderful world, but it's also a heartbreaking world. And when the Bitcoin meetup first started here and a, a nice young fellow that's part of that that started that John Meese very nice guy he and his wife are very sweet and he's a he's a public speaker and he's working hard to to blog and to to advise people and I think he's very good at what he does he's spoken at some some pretty big events I, I like the guy he's a good guy um, but you know initially he was proud of the fact that he was a lifetime member of the Bitcoin Foundation I had a pretty good handle on what they were doing and I had my opinion about what they should be doing that I didn't feel that they were doing, but I didn't have a strong stance. Um, I do have a pretty strong stance right now and that's the part that breaks my heart that they acted so much like a corporation, so much like uh, a company in the real world that is not transparent with their finances. When this is exactly what we're talking about, we want Bitcoin so that nonprofits and so that corporations and distributed autonomous corporations, distributed autonomous organizations can be transparent using the blockchain technology. So, you know, hey, guys, you're the Bitcoin Foundation. Set an example for us and show us how. You know, and even when they had their elections, they weren't able to use blockchain technology to have a transparent election. You know, how pathetic. And, you know, even earlier than that, when Andreas Antonopoulos was warning people about Mt. Gox and warning people about, you know, not having your bitcoins held by a company that's basically acting as a custodian, you know, hold on to your own bitcoins was the message and people didn't listen and people got goxed and people got ripped off by other companies and individuals and, you know, throughout all of that. Now I'm remembering actually one of the first criticisms I had that I brought to John Meese when he told me I'm a lifetime member of the Bitcoin Foundation. I said, where were these guys when Andreas and a lot of other Bitcoin gurus, intelligent people were warning people and me too, just on a personal level, warning people not to have their bitcoins and their cash, right, their fiat and their, you know, other digital currencies on an exchange. Where was the Bitcoin Foundation? Isn't that something that they should have been doing in terms of educating people? So they dropped the ball there. Someone can argue with me about that. And then I can just go back and I can start bringing the history forward. And I can access that history and I can access those documents and I can prove that they were not educating people. Clearly, they had no interest in educating people to save people had they had the interest. And had they been vocal and put that out there, educating people, right? Educating people about this new technology, what to and what not to do. Had they done that, they could have saved people millions and millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars. They didn't. They failed in that. And then they failed in their own transparency and all of these people tithing to these high priests and the Bitcoin Foundation. And that money, that Bitcoin, that value, where did that go? Where's the paper trail for that? Where's the proof of what they did with that money? There isn't any. What adds insult to injury is not just how crappy they were in their bookkeeping and how unwilling they were to be transparent, how opaque they were. What really adds insult to injury is that very few people in the Bitcoin world were screaming at the top of their lungs, you crooks. You know, you're acting just like the crappy corporations that we all hate, you know, and they can stand up and they can say, well, we're not crooks. We just we were, you know, we just we were busy. We were no, 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 no. If you're not being transparent with your finances that are coming in from people tithing to you to be members, right? And if you're not being transparent with that, then you're being opaque. And if you're being opaque, then you're being the exact opposite of what Bitcoin initially was supposed to stand for. If you were part of that organization during all of that, you're a scumbag, you know, and if you are trying to, you know, have a good name for yourself now and hoping that people have forgot about it. Trust me, there are people like me that because you, whoever you are, I'm pointing to anybody that was part of the Bitcoin Foundation at that time. I pointed to you and saying, if you were not standing up for what is right then, and if you're not now saying, man, I feel bad, I should have stood up for that, then I apologize, folks. If you're not doing either one of those things, then you're a scumbag. 
you can tell I have strong feelings about it. I think that that is why people like bitcoins and gravy and like hearing me speak, you know, because I can speak with strength without using profanity. And believe me, man, I want to use profanity. I'm an expert with profanity, man. I don't know if you've seen the film. It's a great documentary. I just watched the other evening for the first time called Four Horsemen. No. What's that about? It's phenomenal, man. It just, you know, kind of takes you through these different phases of where we are in our country and our history and kind of parallels that with, you know, Rome. But it does it in such an intelligent way. It talks about empires will last 250 years. And here's what you'll see at these different stages of the empire. And we're seeing those stages. But, you know, we've all heard this kind of thing before. And we've all heard the parallel to Rome with the United States. And it's it's bound to fall and all of this. But what I liked about this documentary is that you have so many really well-spoken experts that they bring in that they're interviewing and then the voiceover work is great and whoever wrote the script to it is just spot on, man. It's just packed full of historically accurate, pressing, compelling information. I just really love the film. I recommend it to anybody for, I, I don't think it's called The Four Horsemen. I think it's just called Four Horsemen. Good. I'll definitely link to that in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. And it sounds really interesting. But as soon as you started talking about that, I already was thinking, well, let's talk about your film, the film that you were the voice of. Oh, yeah. Bitcoin, The End of Money by Torsten Hoffman. Great film. I highly recommend it for anybody who is into Bitcoin or for anybody who kind of wants to introduce the idea of Bitcoin to family or friends. I think it gives a really good basic understanding of what money means and where our money and banking system came from, the birth of our money and banking system, and then brings the viewer up to the present. And, uh, you know, it asks some compelling questions. The film does not have all the answers. It's not supposed to have all the answers, but um, it, I think it's a great film. I think whoever did the voiceover work for it was phenomenal. Oh, wait, that was me. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think I did a good job on the voiceover work for that. And I was happy to help Torsen Hall went out with that and I actually made a little bit of money with that and uh, I think the film is doing well I think that when the price of Bitcoin starts going back up I think we're going to see a resurgence of interest in anything to do with Bitcoin if you've had a podcast or if you have a podcast if you write a blog if you're one of the people that's been involved in Bitcoin I think we're going to see people really falling on this thing hard like we've never seen before and I think if you're a cryptocurrency. I think if you're Dogecoin or if you're barbecue coin, I think that you're going to have people coming out of the woodwork and trading this. You know, there's still people are still actively trading all of these whacked out cryptocurrencies. But I think when we see the price of Bitcoin going up and leading the charge and heading toward the moon, I think that we're all going to be more than a little shocked at what uh, at what happens with the entire Bitcoin sphere and all of the digital currencies and all of the podcasts and all of the writings that uh, have gone on. And uh, I think it's going to be a phenomenon that is going to be double or triple or quadruple of what we've seen before. So if the price of Bitcoin goes back up, we might get some more Bitcoins and gravy? Well, it's hard to say, man. Uh, uh oh, that's a no. That's a kind, <laughs> kind way of saying no. <laughs> well, no, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, when the price of Bitcoin goes back up, I think you'll have people coming in that will want to sink their teeth into any and all Bitcoin information. So there will be a resurgence of people watching these YouTube videos that have been out for years, the early ones of Andreas Antonopoulos on up to ones he's, you know, done currently on up to his speaking engagements in recent times that have been, you know, videotaped and uh, all of the audio stuff, all of the writings. I think you're going to have, you know, the number of people that are going to be coming into the Bitcoin world is going to be phenomenal. And there's only so much content out there that they're going to be able to be biting into so that I think that shows like mine and like yours and anything on the Let's Talk Bitcoin, people are going to be going back and they're going to be listening to the very first episode of the Bitcoin game and the very first episode of Bitcoins and Gravy. And they're going to want to learn and they're going to want to hear these interviews that were from the good old days, right? The first days, the early days. And, you know, we, hey, man, we may see 20, 30 years from now that these become like the old silent films, <laughs> You know, these shows, people are, are going back and listening. These were some of the early Bitcoin shows. Listen how interesting these were because, you know, it was just the very beginning of Bitcoin. So, yeah, I think we're going to see all of that. I really do. It, you know, it's just going to take a little bit of time. Hard to say what's going to happen with the world economy, and that can have a huge effect on it, too. You're going to stay in just as involved as ever in Bitcoin. You're just not going to spend all this time to put out a podcast. Is that is that where you're at? 
Or are you taking a break from Bitcoin, kind of? Well, no, I mean, I'm definitely still in the Bitcoin world. I still talk with people about Bitcoin every single day. Um, I still coach people. I still help people set up wallets. No, I'm still in the Bitcoin world very much so and still very interested in still talking with people. And um, I still, you know, read and research and keep abreast of what's going on in the Bitcoin world every single day, like a lot of people do. So my interest has not waned, but as far as podcasting, you know, I've I've started another podcast here in East Nashville, and uh, even that, Rob, even that is difficult for me because I have uh, I have some problems with my hands. So that's that's been a major factor in me stopping the Bitcoin podcast is the pain that I have every single day in my hands. Not to mention my back, but really it's my hands. I'm actually going up north here uh, about a week from now. And uh, to, to see the same surgeon, he's still working after all of these years that, that did the surgery on my right hand some 32 years ago, I think. I'm going to find out if I need to have surgery on it again. We'll see what, see what happens. But yeah, that's been a major factor in me slowing down. And uh, you know, even now, I've slowed down this East Nashville podcast. It's called East Nashville Now, a podcast about the people and the places that make East Nashville great. I've had to slow this down. I think my last interview, I just, or the last show I put out was just 25 minutes or something like that. So yeah, I'm really trying to do less editing and less typing and stay off the keyboard. And it's really hard because you know, so much of my life, what I do and how I like to communicate with people involves sitting at the keyboard and typing. So it's been tough. Wow, that's uh, that sounds really tough. Is your regular job just as affected? I mean, do you have work where you're not on the keyboard all the time? My regular job is a research position I've had for many years, and it's primarily over the telephone, thankfully. You're not going to weigh in on block size. I can talk about it, but I mean, I, I don't really know. I don't. I even... think either of us could probably see as well as anyone that it's divisive in nature and it's the divisiveness may, has me worried a little bit, you know? I mean, how yeah. do you feel about it? Gosh darn it. It's so hard, man, because, you know, I mean, there was a time, you know, I used to put Gavin, for instance, in, I used to hold him in pretty high regard and then I didn't. And then I felt like he was part of the Bitcoin foundation and their opaque approach. And yet he was regarded as one of the high priests because he had actually been communicating with Satoshi Nakamoto, with the great Satoshi Nakamoto. He had been to the mountain and back. And how many people can say that? He was like a Moses, right? How many people have actually seen the face of God or actually gotten to speak with God directly? So I used to hold him in high regard like that. And yet, and maybe it's his style of communicating, man, because my background is in communication and culture and theories of interpersonal communication. My religion is humanitarianism. You know, I believe we need to work hard to help people understand where we're coming from, work hard to be compassionate, to understand where other people are coming from. And the kind of communication that that requires is very different from a lot of the communication that you have in the world of technology. So I feel like one of the big problems is the folks in the tech world that, you know, are the ones that we're relying on, you know, the developers, <laughs> they have really serious communication problems. And I really feel like somebody needs to be brought in. Someone should have been brought in a long time ago that is an expert and they should have paid them well. Are you an expert? I'm not, but they should have brought, I could, I could mediate, but they should have brought somebody in who is an expert in conflict management and dispute resolution. And there are experts, you know, here in Nashville, Lipscomb University has an excellent master's degree program in conflict management and dispute resolution. That's what they do. What a neat specialty. I would take that course, but I don't have $35,000 a semester, okay? <laughs> you didn't make that enough working as a podcaster? I was close, man, but not quite. <laughs> well, I'm, well, I'm, well, I'm the Bitcoin trader, navigator of the Bitcoin sea. I'm a real motivator when it comes to making money for me. And I might go shorter or long, but I like to tell everybody that I've never been wrong. I'm the Bitcoin trader, come on and hear me sing my song. Well, I made about a quarter million dollars on the old Mount Cox. And I jumped that ship about a year before it hit the rocks. I put a little into LTC. Then I doubled and I bought a place in Waikiki. I'm the Bitcoin trader, come on and take a look at me. When to sell, when we're off 
to the moon like a bat out of hell. I'm the Bitcoin trader, ka hear me ring my bell. More speed ahead, Captain. Ride them a Bitcoin waves, boys, ride them high and low. I said I ride them a Bitcoin waves, heave ho, heave ho. I don't give a damn about no whales. Those moby dicks are gonna burn in hell, so ride them Bitcoin waves away, heave ho. That I don't get hacked. Pray to God Almighty that I don't get hacked. Pray to God Almighty that I don't get hacked today. Governments these days have so much more control over people than they ever have. And that's largely because of the control of the media. The United States is a classic example. We have been some of the best propagandists in the history of the world, right? If you go back and look at early propaganda, and I'm talking about revolutionary war propaganda, right? Boston Tea Party and stuff like that. We're, we're experts at it. Now with television, you know, if, uh, you know, the Internet in many ways is controlled, just Yahoo News alone, you know, so many people have Yahoo or Gmail, all of these things that people use on a regular basis. How is this advertising creeping in there and how are people being controlled? Well, people are really being well controlled. Uh, you know, uh, George Orwell is certainly not just turning over in his grave. He's spinning rapidly. It's like Bruh. what's going on is really is really scary worldwide. I think that bread and circus is very real, you know, to keep the people passive, to keep the people happy. We only need a few things. We need football in the fall and basketball in the winter and uh, dancing with the stars, all of these things. The bread and circuses that keep people happy and keep people passive so that every mother and father, when they have a child, their dream is not uh, let's have less control from the government. Their dream is that little Billy or little Susie gets to one day go to their high school prom and, and that they get to see them out on the field, maybe as a cheerleader or out on the field playing football at their homecoming and carving pumpkins and going trick or treating. These are the American dreams, you know, and I'll tell you what, no matter what happens, if given a choice, American parents are going to vote for that. Do you mind if we take away these freedoms and these freedoms and these freedoms as long as you can still have the homecoming dance and the prom and the trick-or-treating and the football game and the Super Bowl and all? You know, do you mind if we take the No, no, no. Go ahead and take those away because these are what we have to have. These are now our American birthrights. You know, it's insanity. My point is that – and this is really the only – way that I have to view what's going on is from an, an American perspective, although I know a lot about what's going on in other countries too. But from an American perspective, the control is, uh, we're well controlled. And the fact that nobody knows the Federal Reserve is not part of the federal government, the fact that nobody knows that we have this banking cartel, that we have a pharmaceutical cartel, that we have a military industrial complex that we were warned about, you know, and people have talked about so many times in the Bitcoin world uh, that, you know, if you talk to somebody outside of the Bitcoin world, they say it's conspiracy, blah, 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 blah. Really, our government and the corporate powers that control our government have the people by the balls. But guess what? There are a lot of different countries in the world, and there are a lot of different ways of looking at the world, and there are a lot of different economies in the world that are not 
in step with what's going on here in America. Uh, will the petrol dollar be around forever? No, it won't. In fact, petrol w- will not be around forever. So it's only a matter of time before you have all of these disparate economies and all of these different ways of doing business and of thinking about life and thinking about the world all over the planet, right? All of these people that want different things. And a lot of those people don't want U.S. hegemony. A lot of these people don't want for the U.S. to be the world power, you know, till the end of time. Bitcoin can work through all of these. Bitcoin can exist and live and thrive and help people through all of these economies since its inception and for the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, 100 years. It can work throughout all of these economies. Things are going to change. Things are changing. The level of thievery from the central banks and from banks in London and here in the U.S. and elsewhere, that level of thievery cannot be sustained. It's not sustainable. You will have revolution. We're seeing it, right? And when you have enough people that are impoverished, things are going to change. When you have enough people who are being abused, things are going to change. You know, we're going to see some tough times. But throughout all of this, you have this now, this digital currency that really is a better way to do business than paper money, fiat currency. I think it's going to survive. I think it's going to do really well. I think it's going to morph and it's going to change because it's a worldwide phenomenon. I don't think the U.S. dollar and the power of that or the fiat currency of any other country in the world, I don't think that they, moving forward over the next 50 years, I don't think they're going to have the power that they believe they're going to have. I really, truly don't. I think we're seeing the beginning of a paradigm shift in terms of how value can be transferred, you know, of a value transfer network that transcends what we're used to in our own country here in the United States, over in France, over in Great Britain, in China, in Russia, in Japan. I really truly think that a digital currency transcends the fiats of the world and will move us toward a new way of thinking. And I think that the paradigm shift is underway. There will be people after us who see that paradigm shift and there will be a better world as long as we don't nuke ourselves before that happens. Big if, John. (laughs) I hope that everyone's doing well in the Bitcoin world. I may be back at some point. I love hearing all your shows. I listen to a lot of content. I don't always comment. So uh, the odds are high that I'm listening to your show, Rob, or John Ferguson or Adam B. Levine. I'm always reading and always interested and uh, love all you guys with all my heart, man. You guys have changed my life. <laughs> I didn't change your life. Yeah, you, you came before me and you were part of the inspiration, I guess, for trying to, to do a really well-produced show. I'll tell you what, the people that changed my life are the people who I know are sincere and the people I know who have a moral compass that is working well and who are, you know, on the ship of righteousness trying to move us toward a better place. And I know that you're one of those people. So you have influenced my life because when I meet people like Adam B. Levine and like Stephanie Murphy and like Andreas Antonopoulos and John Ferguson and you and John Bush, of course, I love him and his family. I love what he's doing. I love these sincere people. So, you know, Rob, you are one of the sincere people who has changed my life by giving me that hope that there are always going to be new people coming on board who are sincere and who have their mind and their hearts in the right place. So yeah, you definitely have influenced me in a positive way. Certainly, sir, you have. From the very first time I met you there in Austin, you're a very sincere person. For me, that's one of the best things that you can have as an attribute being a human being is being sincere and and doing things that make the world a better place. My first reaction is I'm touched. I didn't expect to feel a little choked up there, John. But but my second thing I'm going to say is before that conference, and I had this funny feeling, I, I ended up booking this hotel room and I told you I had an extra room. I had this worry that you thought, uh, like, who knows what this guy's up to inviting me to his hotel room. (laughs) I had this, this fear that that's what you were thinking. Like, oh no, I got some listener. I'm staying at a listener's. Thanks, Rob. Oh, that's hilarious. 
when I got that offer from a listener, I want to say his name was Rob, but when I got the offer from him to come stay with he and his family there in Austin, for me, that was like a dream come true, not just because that meant I didn't have to pay for a place, but it meant that someone cared about me enough as a host to offer, you know, to trust and trusted me enough to say, hey, come stay with my family. I've got kids. I've got a wife and kids. Come stay with us. You know, so for me, that was like, that was probably at that time, the greatest compliment I had ever received, you know, doing the show. It was someone trusting me enough to say, hey, come stay at my house. So I couldn't have, I couldn't have passed it. Now, (laughs) <laughs> I didn't know at the time it was like a 40 minute drive outside of the city. And had I known that, I probably would have politely excused myself from that and uh, said, Rob, yes. But, you know, on the other hand, I had a private room there and a private bathroom there and I snore really, really loudly. But no, I definitely didn't think anything odd. <laughs> Although, hey, in this world, you never know. What's the most surprising thing ever said during one of your interviews? Gosh, darn it. I'm trying to think if there was anything. Um, (laughs) No, I thought it was funny, though, that when I interviewed Pamela Morgan, I think that she actually agreed to come on the show because (laughs) she actually thought that I had interviewed Giannis Fyrovakis, the former finance minister of Greece. And this was prior to everything that happened that led to Giannis leaving Greece and before the voting and all the whole debacle with Brussels and the Troika. But uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that Pamela Morgan actually was convinced that I had interviewed Giannis. And she probably listened to the interview and decided that I was brilliant for asking the questions that I asked. So she, I think, decided to interview me because she thought I was brilliant and uh Pamela, if you're listening, two things. One, sorry for the deception. And two, if you're ever in Nashville, I'd love to take you out to dinner and drinks. I keep hearing (laughs) moments and I'm like, is that going to be the intro to my show? Is that going to be the intro to my show? You definitely have a lot of fans from probably very ordinary people to obviously really huge people in the Bitcoin space who are inviting you to private islands for Satoshi roundtables. I mean, if someone just feels like saying hi to you, what's the best way to get in touch with you? As always, just email me at howdy, H-O-W-D-Y, as in howdy, howdy at bitcoinsandgravy.com. But I should also say that they can also reach me at my everyday email, um, which is jcbarrett2003 at yahoo.com. So what's going on? You know, I'm doing the East Nashville Now podcast, trying to talk with people who are making a difference, who have made a difference, and who are changing lives in their own way uh, through their philanthropy or through their nonprofits or through the work that they do. That's what my podcast is about, East Nashville Now, a podcast about the people and the places that make East Nashville great. So, yeah, you can check it out. Uh, Just go to eastnashvillenow.com. Now, if there's anyone in the Bitcoin space who thinks you could help them, I don't know, with its voiceover or in a previous interview, I don't know if you caught my purse interview. I'm still having a hard time imagining you listening to that many of my episodes, but, ah. but I don't know if you caught my purse interview. Thomas Hunt, um, uh, Mad Bitcoins now works for purse. I can't help but think someone in the Bitcoin space may have something where they can leverage all the goodwill that John Barrett has, his amazing voiceover talent, his, I'm talking to you like you're not here. Um, (laughs) If someone came knocking on your door with some kind of work for you in the Bitcoin space, are you open? Absolutely, man. You know, again, I've always felt like being in the Bitcoin sphere, not being a tech guy. My background is in public speaking. My background is in entertainment. I'm a songwriter. I'm a writer. I'm a poet. I've always felt like in a way I didn't fit in. Even the very first time I shook Andreas Antonopoulos's hand two years ago in Austin at the Texas Bitcoin conference, you know, he made it very clear that he thought And that he thinks it's important in the Bitcoin world for us to have art and music and literature and theater and all of this. And, you know, for that reason, I've been pushing Max Hernandez after he wrote Thieves Emporium 
anybody has not read Thieves Emporium, go out and buy the book, you know, honor the guy, buy the paper book. I've been pushing him, he's a friend of mine, to write the definitive Bitcoin novel. And I said, man, if you write this thing, you're going to, you're going to be on the map all over the world and you're going to be, you're going to make a million bucks. But you know, so I agree with Andreas that we need to have all of these things in the Bitcoin sphere, in the Bitcoin world, the real world in quotation marks has. So, you know, I like to think that I've added some comedy and some good music to the Bitcoin world and some good conversations. And I've, you know, been able to interview some interesting people and share with the listeners what they had to say and uh, answer questions and all of that. So I feel like I've been an asset to the Bitcoin world. And yet I also feel feel like a jester, court jester, like a phony in a way, because I, I truly had nothing to do with, you know, the technology behind this. And I never will, you know, and I'm not doing anything that is going to lead to people being able to send money back home remittances better than they were 10 years ago. I'm really not doing anything to facilitate a lot of the wallet security and the important things that are going on with smart contracts or any of that. So, you know, uh, I feel like I've played an, an interesting, fun role, but I, I certainly don't feel like I'm, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, like I'm one of the important players. I would love to play a bigger role in the Bitcoin world. When Torsten Hoffman asked me to do the voiceover for his documentary, Bitcoin, the End of Money, I was thrilled, you know, he paid me and I would have done it for free. You know, yeah, I was thrilled to be a part of that project. And so, yeah, I would love to do other projects in the Bitcoin world and to help people out. I would love to be involved in something that is working with educating people, working with children, working to help make people's lives better in some way. Uh, I would love to be doing something like that and getting paid for it. That would be, man, that would just be a dream come true. Maybe you're putting that question out there. Am I answering it that way? Maybe, maybe something will happen. Who knows? I honestly feel like somewhere there's with all these big Bitcoin startups and smaller ones and everything somewhere, someone's got to have a use for someone like you. It's funny because I am notoriously bad at or disinterested in pushing myself. Shoot, I did a voiceover for a documentary film. Well, you'd think that I'd continue to do the show and advertise as Stephanie Murphy does and say, hey, I do voiceover work. If you need some voiceover work, I'll come do some voiceover work. I can also do some character voices and funny stuff, right? Early on when Lidge and I started the show, I really wanted to make the show like an old radio show. And I really wanted to have sound effects and bring on guests and have regular, you know, uh, guests that were my different voices that I can do. And I really wanted it to be just highly, highly entertaining more than just interviewing people. Well, I think Lidge was not that into that idea, which is fine. And so I couldn't really do that on my own. When I started the show on my own, when Lidge left the show, I did some fun stuff. I did some interesting, funny little bits and comedic things and, and just little voice things that were interesting. And I really enjoyed that. And then I found myself getting burned out on it because it was so time intensive to create these little bits. Um, and so I would love to, still, I would love to have a podcast and, you know, same for the East Nashville Now podcast. I would love to have a podcast that's really entertaining where people tune in to be entertained in the same way that Garrison Keillor, one of my heroes, because he was so vocal in speaking out against our um, immoral and illegal invasion of Iraq, you know, like that, where you have a group of people who are working together to create something that's dynamic and that's uh, compelling and that's highly entertaining so that not just entertaining in the Bitcoin world, but entertaining but for anybody that would listen to it of any age and a family-oriented show that would be like an old radio show. So, you know, I do have that strong interest in doing that. It's just that, you know, I find myself just chipping away at, at interviewing people for my show and enjoying it, but really not bringing the level of quality entertainment to people that I know that I'm capable of. It just takes a lot of work, man. Thanks so much, John. Hey, thank you, Rob. I appreciate the interview, man. I really do. And I appreciate everything you do in the Bitcoin space. And uh, I love your show, dude. Thanks, John. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care, man. Thanks so much for listening to episode 27 of The Bitcoin Game. 
If you miss John Barrett and never sent him a tip after listening to many hours of content he created, it's not too late. You'll find relevant links and more in this episode's show notes, including an old photo of John that you've probably never seen before. Vegetarians may want to look away. You'll find all episodes of The Bitcoin Game at thebitcoingame.com. You'll find me on Twitter at the BTC Game. See you next time. Psst. Hey, you. How'd you like a VIP pass to the super secret Bitcoins and Gravy after show? Yeah? Well, follow me. We're taking you live now to the historic Woodland Street Theater in beautiful East Nashville, Tennessee, where Reverend Johnny's big band Down Home Country Jam is set to debut their new single, Ode to Satoshi. Hit it, Johnny. Thank you very kindly, friends. I'd like to dedicate this song to the great American freedom fighter and songwriter, Mr. Pete Seeger. May you rest in peace. I would also like to dedicate this song to Andreas Antonopoulos for his words of wisdom and hope for us all. Now climb aboard, y'all. This train is bound for glory. And there's plenty of room for all. Well, Satoshi Nakamoto, that's a name I love to say. And we don't know much about him, but he came to save the day. When he wrote about the way things are and the way things are to be, he gave us all a protocol this world had never seen. A Bitcoin as you're going into the old blockchain. Everybody knows till everybody knows your name Down the road it will be told about the death of old Mount Gox About traders trading altar coins and miners mining blocks But them good old boys back in Illinois and on down through Tennessee See, they don't care to be a millionaire, they're just wanting to be free Our Bitcoin as you're going into the old blockchain A promise to deliver us from age-old tyranny A Bitcoin as you're going into the old blockchain A Bitcoin, I know you're going to rain, going to rain Till everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your name Till everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your name Give me some exposure Everybody knows your name, sing it Oh Lord, pass me some more You know what? This is going to be sound silly, perhaps to you. I don't. I hold a mic when I talk. That's hilarious. Don't don't hold that mic anymore, man. It'll drive you crazy. That's how I do I do it all the time. I bought. It's funny when I first started podcasting. I really wanted one of those fancy looking um, little stands, you know, with the arm. Oh yeah. And then I saw on Amazon they had really nice looking, like these big condenser mic things that oh, looked, yeah. you know, for not that much money. So I bought bought that whole setup but i found because i'm in a noisy location i felt like that mic was more sensitive and mm. would really pick up everything 
And also I had some problem because it was phantom powered and I don't know something I'm using is not very good. Your sound is very good now though. That's good. Well, this is yeah. a Shure SM58 and I, I tried it and I just found, hey, I keep it close to my mouth. It seems to really uh, decrease the amount of ambient noise that that comes in so that's crazy that's an sm58 dude that's like the microphone the rolling stones use <laughs> back, back in the day the sm58 and 59 that's crazy that's cray cray man well i just i read that it was a pretty versatile all-around favored mic that wasn't too expensive so <laughs> one criticism and i hope you'll play this i have with epicenter bitcoin i don't remember the two guys names i'm just i'm bad with names but the guy that has the lighter colored hair yeah that guy has got to get something on his mic. Look, dude, if you're listening, just plug your mic into something else and give yourself some deverb. There's actually plugins if you're using Pro Tools or whatever. You can actually get these plugins that take the reverb out of the room. You sound like you're in a garage. I'm just throwing that out there. You'll probably edit that out. Who cares? I don't know. <laughs> well, it's funny because I actually have seen that in the show notes. Someone mentioned that exact point, you know, just all the echo you hear. And I, I liked the comment because I agreed that, you know, it sounds like a standard kind of, a, I guess, Skype meeting or something rather than, uh, I guess, what you think from I, one of the most popular Bitcoin podcasts, I'd probably say. And you know what? These are, you know, going to live on in perpetuity for as long as electricity <laughs> 